Welcome to the ESI family. My name is Dr. Robert Morse. I'm the program manager at ESI. I put this video together to help you experience success on your first day of subbing. Before we begin, let me say that we are so grateful that you're taking on this adventure. Substitutes like you make a significant difference in the daily lives of students and teachers. You're doing important work. So, you've accepted your first subbing job. Now what? You'll be stepping into a classroom very soon, perhaps for the first time as a substitute teacher. As you prepare for your day, you'll want to think about what you will need to bring with you. First, figure out what you're going to wear. Remember, you are a role model and a professional, so choose clothing that is appropriate for the setting and the sub job you're doing that day. If you're working with younger kids, you may be sitting in tiny chairs, kneeling, or sitting on the floor throughout the day. Comfortable footwear is critical because you'll be on your feet all day. Please refer to the ESI employee handbook for more information on appropriate professional dress. Second, take care of yourself. What food and nutrition will you need to get you through the day? Prepare your lunch, snacks, and a water bottle. It's important to stay hydrated. Personally, I would avoid cafeteria food if possible. It hits a little different as an adult than it did when we were students in school, if you know what I mean. I would suggest having a backpack, a book bag, or even a rolling cart to hold your subbing supplies. The rolling cart may be a bit over the top, but I won't judge. You may not have a lot in your sub toolkit when you first start subbing, but you will find what supplies are important to you as you sub more days. At minimum, I would suggest having pens, pencils, a dry erase marker, notepad, personal hand sanitizer, and a few of your favorite children's books or appropriate young adult books and stories. I've worked with some of our ESI subs to help develop a list of possible supplies for your own personal sub toolkit. You can download this list from the Safe School site where you access this video. Before you leave the house, make sure you've confirmed your job for the day, including the hours you will be working, the school address, the grade level or subject area, and the room location, if it's available. Determine how long it will take you to travel to the school site during morning rush hour and give yourself plenty of time to park and check in at the front office. Did you turn off the stove and feed the pets? Do you have gas in your car? Okay, let's head out. It should go without saying that you should drive with an extra layer of caution when driving through a school parking lot. Kids can pop up from anywhere, so please be very careful. Perhaps one of these days, we'll convince our schools that subs deserve VIP parking up front and in the shade. But until then, please be mindful of designated spots that are meant for other individuals. Take a deep breath and smile. Enter through the main office entrance. Upon entering the front office, notify the front desk clerk that you are a substitute and who you are substituting for. Remember, all of the staff working at the front office are your friend and a resource to you. Take note of their names and share a few kind words. You will sign in using whatever sign-in system the school has in place. Every check-in process is unique to the school, so be flexible. Ideally, someone at the front desk will provide you with a room key, a school map, a folder with lesson plans, classroom information, and possibly escort you to the classroom. Ask the front desk clerk if there are any scheduled emergency drills taking place that day and if there are any special instructions you may need to know for these drills. This could include fire drills or lockdowns. It may save you from having a panic, a panic attack later in the day. If you don't already know, 
You may want to ask the front desk if you are required to do any duties during the day. It's not ideal, but you may have a morning duty or an after school duty that is part of your work day. If you don't feel comfortable locating the classroom, ask for assistance. This is also the time you should ask where the te nearest teacher bathroom is in relation to your classroom. I would suggest using the bathroom now. You probably have to go and you may not get another chance for a bit. Pro tip, never use a student bathroom. It's really gross and it's not appropriate to be in the bathroom by yourself with students. When you get to the classroom, locate any materials that the teacher may have left for you. Ideally, the teacher has left materials appropriately labeled in a folder or a tub on a teacher desk or table. Take time to introduce yourself to any neighboring teachers. They are also your friends. You may need their support if you have any challenges with a student or need assistance with any unexpected events that may happen during the day. Pro tip, if you see any custodial staff on your way to the classroom, make sure you introduce yourself and say hello. You might need them during the day. Okay, back to the materials. Hopefully you're in a situation where the teacher has left you with a full day of detailed plans and materials. Review the class schedule. Orient yourself with what the day looks like for you as a whole. When do the students arrive? Do you pick the students up from the playground? Do students go to any special classes like art, music, PE during the day? What time do they go to lunch? What time does the day end? Are there any notes about specific students who leave the classroom for special services during the day? Locate the classroom roster and determine how attendance is taken. If you need support with attendance, you can ask your new friends, the front desk, or your teacher neighbor. Depending on the age group, students can also be helpful with the attendance process. Additionally, look for seating charts and understand that these charts are not always up to date. Review the lesson plans and locate all materials that are referenced in the plans prior to students arriving. You are expected to follow lesson plans as closely as possible. Write your name on the board and prepare any bell work that may be part of the lesson plans. Bell work is work that takes place immediately upon students entering the room. As you become more comfortable with subbing, you may want to add bell work resources to your own personal toolkit. That's a lot of stuff, right? I suggest giving yourself at least 20 minutes of time to orient yourself before students arrive. One last thing before students arrive. Did you go to the bathroom? Okay, take a deep breath and smile. You've got this. The students are either coming to the classroom or you're picking them up from the playground or somewhere else on the campus. Smile and be confident. If possible, plan to greet all students as they enter the classroom. Eye contact, a smile, a good morning to each student will go a long way. Pro tip, if the routine is for students to line up outside of the classroom before coming in, this is a great opportunity to provide some brief expectations to the class prior to entering the classroom. What do you want them to do upon entering the classroom? For example, good morning, my name is Dr. Morse. I'll be your substitute teacher today. When you enter the room, please quickly submit your homework into the bin and begin the bell work that is posted on the board. I'll begin by taking attendance and tell you a little bit more about myself. If the routine is for students to enter the classroom as a period is starting, more of a junior high or high school setting, you can still greet students at the front door as they enter the room. Once again, make sure your name is on the board. If there is no clear routine in place, you may want to jot down a few simple directions for students to follow as they come in. Pro tip, you don't want a lot of dead time once students enter the room or when transitioning between activities. The more dead time you have, 
the greater chance there is for students to misbehave. Keep a sense of urgency by providing clear instructions for what's next. Taking attendance can be different in each school setting you're in. In elementary settings, you will likely take attendance as soon as students enter the classroom in the morning. You may do this on paper or on a computer. It's not common for substitutes to complete attendance on the computer due to a lack of training and a lack of access. For middle school and high school settings, it's very likely that you will take attendance for each new period when you have a new group of students. Be clear to students that if they do not respond to you calling their name, they will be marked absent. Sometimes the classroom teacher may have a designated attendance taker. If that is the case, let the student do their assigned task. By this time, you should have introduced yourself as the sub or guest teacher for the day. Before you get into delivering the activities on the lesson plan, set an expectation for learning for the day. If the teacher has provided you with classroom behavior or learning expectations, restate what those are and that you expect students to follow them. If there are no clear expectations, make your own. Three or four behavior expectations are adequate. Jot them on the board and review them with the class. For example, I might say, good morning everyone. I'm excited to be your substitute teacher today. This is going to be a great day of learning. I have a few behavior expectations that I would like us to follow in order to ensure that we have a great learning day. First, be respectful. Second, stay on task. Third, raise your hand. If time permits, you could take a few minutes to provide examples of what your behavior expectations look like or sound like. Establishing a presence in the classroom shows students that you have an idea of what you're doing and you are prepared. It shows you care. Classroom management is one of the most requested topics for support by substitute teachers. All the information that I've provided up to this point relates to classroom management. Just by being prepared and confident about the flow of the school day, you are showing the students that you know your stuff. Student behavior concerns often increase when students do not know what is expected of them at any point in the day. The greater confidence you have in the class schedule and the lesson plans, the better you are able to maintain a sense of urgency for learning throughout the day. Transitions between lessons and class periods are where many classroom management concerns arise. Students enter the classroom and don't know what the, they are expected to do, or students complete an activity and aren't clear on what to do when they're finished. Students may also be moving from one area to another in the classroom, like from the carpet to their desks, or from a small group activity to individual work. You can be proactive in managing classroom behaviors by setting a clear expectation about what to do next in any of these situations. For example, before having students start an independent activity, I might say, I will set a timer for 20 minutes to work on this assignment. You're expected to work independently. You may not talk with your table partners during this assignment. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will come to you. When you're finished, you will take out your independent reading materials and read until the timer goes off. When the timer goes off, you will safely come to the carpet with your paper and some of you will share your work with the class. What questions do you all have about my expectations? Tamika, will you, what will you do when you finish your work? Phil, when the timer goes off, what will you do? In that example, I set a clear expectation of how students are to work at, the, at their desks, what they should do if they finish early, and what to do when the timer goes off. I followed my instructions by checking for understanding with a couple of students. Having a clear way to get students' attention is an important part of classroom management. Without setting an expectation for getting students' attention, you may find yourself raising your voice or even yelling 
when that is not necessary. Many teachers already have established strategies for getting the student's attention, and they will provide a, des a description within the lesson plans. However, you may be in a situation where there's no clear method for gaining students' attention. With younger students, there are many fun ways to get students' attention. You can have students respond to a call out like, one, two, three, eyes on me. The students would respond, one, two, eyes on you, or class, 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 and students would respond, yes, yes, yes. For older students, you may use a timer or a wind chime or a bell to get a, their attention. What is key is that once the students respond, they stop everything they're doing. They are quiet and they're looking at you, waiting for your direction. A key strategy for classroom management as a substitute is to circulate the classroom. This is why you're wearing those comfortable shoes. Circulating the classroom allows you to monitor whether or not students are staying on task. It also shows students that you are engaged in what is happening. While you're circulating, you can ask questions to check for understanding, provide support to students who may need help, and redirect students who are off task. Just by circulating the classroom, you are proactively managing the classroom and preventing potential behaviors that could interrupt learning. I can't stress it enough Circulate, circulate, circulate. The more time you spend in the classroom, the more likely you are to be faced with student behavior concerns. Ask yourself if those behaviors that you're observing are inconsequential or need to be addressed. Inconsequential behaviors are those behaviors that do not interrupt the classroom learning, like a single student that has not gotten started on their work, a student that is talking, a student that is out of their desk. Pro tip, rather than focusing on all the things that students may be doing wrong, spend most of your energy on reinforcing all the things that you, stu you see students doing right. I like how Mitchell quickly got started on his work. Sarah, thank you for raising your hand to ask a question. Tamika, nice job of holding the door open for the class. Another strategy that can be useful for those students who do not respond well to quick redirection is to channel the student into making better choices by having them be a helper or be responsible for a task. For example, if Sam is having a difficult time staying in her seat during independent math work, I could task her with writing out one of her math problems on the whiteboard while the rest of the students are finishing up their work. Sam could then talk through her thinking on the problem with the rest of the class. Consequential behaviors are those that take away from learning of the many students and could potentially be dangerous. Many teachers have established systems for rewarding good behaviors and providing consequences for inappropriate or consequential behaviors. If a teacher has provided guidelines on the classroom behavior tracking system, Try your best to follow the system. If there's no system and you do not feel comfortable handling a behavior situation that is escalated, get help. I would suggest reaching out to the neighboring teacher first if that is an option. You can also call up to the front desk to request support. You should never send a student out of the classroom unless you've notified the front office for approval. It is impossible to cover, cover classroom management strategies in depth in the short time that we have. There are many resources on the topic of classroom management available online. You can also keep a lookout for future ESI SubConnect sessions that focus on the topic of classroom management. Just like classroom management, Facilitating instruction is a huge topic that professional teachers take several semesters of courses on as part of earning a teaching degree. Depending on the grade level and subject area, there are numerous instructional methodologies that may be implemented in order to teach concepts to students. 
It is a skill set that is developed by teachers throughout their careers. Knowing that, I'm going to give you some very basic strategies for facilitating instruction in the short time that we have. First, I've stated this before, if the classroom teacher has given you lesson plans, you are expected to follow the plans. Some teachers will provide directions on exactly how they want you to facilitate a lesson. If you're provided directions on how to teach a concept, you should follow it. You can learn quite a bit about good teaching practices by subbing in a range of classrooms. There will also be times when you receive limited or no lesson plans for the school day. Don't panic. This is when having a personal toolkit will come into play. As I mentioned, you will build your personal sub toolkit as you gain more and more experience subbing. Part of your personal toolkit will include a range of teaching strategies. It truly takes time and experience to build these tools. In its simplest form, a lesson plan provides an overall objective or goal, the method or procedure for how students will reach the objective, and an opportunity to measure if students meet the objective. Objectives are built based off of standards for learning for a specific subject or grade level, and they describe what the students should know and be able to do by the end of the lesson. Teachers take into account what students need to learn by the end of a particular teaching unit, what they learned so far within that unit, and what they need to learn next in order to work toward the overall unit outcomes. The methods, or how the teacher will teach the new content, are identified based on a balance of content knowledge, knowledge of what students know, and their learning styles. In order to know if students are able to meet the lesson objective, there's usually an opportunity to practice and an assessment of learning. Sometimes these two are combined as one activity, and other times there's a separate activity that is given as an assessment at the end of the lesson. Students may complete the activities with a partner, with a group, or independently. Differentiated instructional techniques are used to attend to the different learning levels and learning styles of students. One basic approach to differentiating instruction is to provide small group and individualized instruction. For example, while the class is working on an independent reading assignment, the teacher could meet with a small group or individual student who needs support with a specific reading skill. A common instructional approach that is used for teaching a lesson is I do, we do, you do. In this instructional approach, you start with I do, where you are modeling what you want students to be able to do. For example, you may be teaching the students a new math strategy or reviewing a math strategy that students have recently learned. During the I do stage of the lesson, you are modeling the steps of solving the problem on the board, while also thinking aloud. It is best to break your modeling up into smaller steps. You can even write down a list of the steps students will follow and provide a visual to represent each step. Depending on the complexity and newness of the strategy, you might model a couple different math problems before moving to the next stage. The next stage is we do. During this stage, you can model another problem or two on the board while calling on students to provide you with each step. You can extend the we do stage by having students work on a problem independently or with a partner or group while you provide support and feedback. During the we do stage of the lesson, you can incorporate questions to check students' understanding. Here's a pro tip. A simple set of popsicle sticks can ensure a balance of participation in classroom lessons. Instead of calling on the same group of students who raise their hands to answer a question, 
Have each student write their name on a popsicle stick or a small piece of paper at the start of the day and use these to draw names throughout the day. Here's a pro tip. Before asking a question, call on the student who you want to respond to the question and then ask the question. This will ensure that you're not catching students off guard. Provide wait time after you ask a question. It gives kids the chance to think. Finally, when you think students are mostly ready, you can move to the you do stage of the lesson where students will independently complete the task. This is also considered an assessment of whatever new learning you have identified as part of the lesson objective. Pro tip, during independent work, this is a great time to circulate the classroom to ensure students are on task, and more importantly, identify any students who may be struggling. You may want to provide additional support to those students and make note to let the teacher know what you've observed. The I do, we do, you do approach to teaching utilizes a gradual release of responsibility from the teacher to the student. Ultimately, your goal is to build students' confidence in mastering the learning objective. Finally, I'll say it again. The more days you sub, the more you will have an opportunity to learn and develop appropriate instructional strategies for the various groups of students you teach. Be patient with yourself. These skills are not learned overnight. Take it one day at a time and try to learn and grow a little bit every time you enter the classroom. You've made it to the end of the day and the bell is about to ring. You're not quite done yet. Here's a pro tip. It may be difficult to do, but try to leave the classroom as clean and organized as it was when you arrived. You can even tell the students that they can surprise their teacher when she returns by having the room in the better shape than it was when she left. This works better with younger kids. Ideally, the materials left behind by the classroom teacher include some guidance on how students are dismissed. While high school and junior high students typically exit the classroom on their own, lower grade levels typically have dismissal procedures. You may need to escort part or all of your class out of the classroom to the bus lane or to the parent pickup area. If you're not sure what your responsibilities are, make sure you ask the front desk or your neighboring teacher before the end of the school day. If you do not have any after school duty, your day is complete once all the students have safely exited your room or you've escorted them to their pickup locations. I encourage you to leave a note for the classroom teacher. It doesn't have to be long. Let the teacher know if there was anything on the lesson plans that you didn't get to. If there, were, if there were any exceptional behaviors by students, like good or bad. Teachers love to hear about the great things that happened while the sub was there. If you enjoyed your time in the classroom, let the teacher know that you would be interested in subbing in the classroom if there's ever a future need. If you have the chance, provide a few kind words to the neighboring teacher especially if you receive support from your neighbor during the day. Return your keys and sign out. Be sure to thank the front desk clerk for any help you were provided. If you would like to leave feedback for ESI or the school district regarding your subbing experience, you can use our online form. The form is located on the ESI website under Employee Resources. One thing that we've learned from employee feedback over the course of the last couple years is that many of you want an opportunity to connect with each other. Subbing can be a lonely job because you don't get the same opportunities to build strong connections with the staff in the schools you're working in. There are well over 5,000 ESI employees who are doing similar work to you in schools across Arizona. Our team continues to work on ways for ESI employees who have a desire to keep learning and may want to share experiences with other ESI colleagues. 
ESI SubConnect offers two different opportunities to connect and learn. First, we offer monthly SubConnect Zoom sessions. Each session focuses on a topic and provides time for participants to share their experiences and ideas related to the topic. We also have an ESI SubConnect Facebook group. The group is approaching 400 members who are all ESI employees. It is another opportunity to share experiences, ask questions, and get notifications about learning opportunities. I hope you're able to take the time to join us for one or both of these great opportunities.